Uh, okay, here we go. We are live and in color. Now we're in color. All right. So, did everybody have a nice little dinner? Isn't that nice to be able to do that? Where is that young lady at? Is she still here, Carrie? Oh, make sure you thank her. Oh, she's coming. Okay. She did. You guys are awesome. Nothing like sitting around the table and eating together, right? The ultimate fellowship. Breaking bread together and praying together. What a blessing. Yes, we want to thank you, young lady, for your labor of love tonight for cooking for all these people. <laughs> all right, so if you have your Bible, open it up with me to 1 Kings. 1 Kings tonight. And while you're doing that, I'm going to pray to get us started. Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you tonight, Lord, for our wonderful time of prayer that we had. We thank you, Lord, for uh, this time that we have now to open your word, spend time there learning about uh, Solomon and, and the early, early days, Lord. And uh, thank you for the great lessons that we can take from these scriptures and the uh, awesome history that we have here to look at tonight. So we love you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Uh, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would bless it to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, last week, um, you know, we kind of saw how David was nearing his time to take leave of this earth. <laughs> I guess that's a good way to put it. But even then, you know, uh, it was interesting to me that... Uh, um, there was still an attempt to have conspiracies about the throne, even when he's laying in bed close to death, and, and people were still conspiring. And, uh, you know, we saw how Adonijah actually wanted the throne, um, but David's desire, I should say God's desire, was to have Solomon on the throne, and it was a promise that was made. And so that promise was kept. So we're going to pick this up in chapter 2, and uh, you guys just follow along with me, please. It says, Now the days of David drew near that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord your God, to walk in his ways to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn, that the Lord may fulfill his word, which he spoke concerning me, saying, if your sons take heed to their way, to walk before me in truth with all of their heart and with all of their soul, he said, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. So we'll stop right there for a minute. Um, it is determined now that Solomon will be the new king. He will be on the throne. Um, I think that the one of the very first judgments that Solomon make is a judgment concerning Adonijah. He had every right um, to have Adonijah put to death. He was conspiring to take the throne. He was committing the ultimate treason. And Solomon had mercy on this man. Um, and we saw that, you know, his, uh, Solomon's consensus of this was, is if he proves himself to be a good guy, then nothing's going to happen to him. Nothing, not one, it's, well, Solomon said, not one of his hairs will fall to the earth. But, he said, if wickedness is found in him, he'll die. So he's given him mercy. Okay, now quickly, what's mercy? Mercy is not getting what you deserve. That's what mercy is. 
That's exactly what Solomon is showing to his older brother here, Adonijah, half-brother, I suppose. He's showing him mercy because he is worthy of death, and Solomon is re uh, giving him a reprieve of that, showing mercy to him. Um, now, now that we've defined mercy, there's a Siamese twin that lives with mercy. You know who that is? Grace. What a wonderful name, Grace. My wife's horse is named Grace. Um, so what's grace? If, if mercy is not getting what I deserve, then what is grace? Grace is getting what I don't deserve. Receiving what I can't earn. Receiving what I could never be good enough to have. That's the grace of God in our lives. The mercy and the grace, the Siamese twins, they, they operate together. One gives me a reprieve for the sentence I deserve, and the other one gives me life that I don't deserve. Beautiful, beautiful transaction there that uh, Jesus offers us as his kids. So Solomon, you know, he, uh, he gives this guy a break. And as David's getting close to uh, dying, it says his time is drawing near that he should die. We know from the last chapter that his time was pretty near already because he was in bed and he couldn't get warm and his health was terrible. And uh, so we know that it was close in chapter 1. I like what he says in, chapter, in verse 2 here. It says, I go the way of all the earth. That's powerful when you think about it. I go the way of all men, women, humans, life, period, ends, doesn't it, in this world in which we live. And it's really kind of a sad thing when you think about it. Why is it that we all go the way of the, all the earth? What, why? Why can't we just, you know, your body heals when you, when you damage it, when you cut it. You break a bone and it heals. How come our bodies just don't heal over and over and we just keep on living for a thousand years? What is getting in the way of that? It's called sin, right? Hi. How are you? Come on in. Yeah, good to have you. Welcome, welcome. So, yeah, that's the reason, you know, even though, aren't you glad, though, if you cut yourself, you heal, or you break a bone and it mends? Um, always good, uh, you know, to have that blessing in our lives. Um, but when it comes to aging, when it comes to uh, getting to the place where David is right now and where many of us are headlong running to in our lives, um, it just seems sometimes unfair. I don't know how you feel about it, but, you know, losing my daughter-in-law seemed unfair to me. She was young. Why? I don't understand. I really don't understand. Even, now I'm so shallow-minded, okay, when it comes to this kind of stuff. Even losing my dog breaks my heart. And it makes me want to question the Lord and say, why, Lord? He was five years old. He was the greatest dog on the planet. And you took him. Now he's buried in my yard back there, you know. But David realizes, I am going the way of all the earth. I'm going to the grave. That's where I'm going. And so he wants to give him some really solid advice right here as far as being the king. Um, be strong. These first two things that he mentions. Be strong and show yourself a man. Prove, he said, yourself a man. So what's interesting to me about that is, um, do you think maybe Solomon wasn't very manly? Do you think maybe he was really pampered? Do you think maybe Solomon was, you know, uh, not a macho kind of a guy? Maybe he was a little bit reserved. Uh, you know that he didn't appear to have like violent power-hungry tendencies. We see that in his first judgment with Adonijah here. But David sees it necessary here. You know, you've kind of been a tattletale. You've kind of been a little bit, you know, unmanly. So you need to be a man if you're going to sit on the throne. You need to be able to make those calls, the hard calls that you're going to need to make 
as the king and prove yourself a man. Well, those are immediate, personal advice that he's given him. Those two things. But then in verse 3, his words change. It goes from your personal issue now to your spiritual issue. Keep the charge of the Lord your God. What is the charge of the Lord your God? You know, when I was ordained to be a pastor, and they put hands on me, and they, they, they prayed a prayer, and, and, and they said, we charge you by the living God to honor that position and to serve God with all your heart. It's, the charge is we're, we're challenging you. We're putting that on your lap. On your, that's your thing that you're going to need to defend and hold on to. How do you hold on to that? Can you do that in your own strength? No. You know, I hear a lot of people come to me and they say, Oh, man, yeah, I hope to be a pastor someday too. And I look at them and I go, Really? I was right where you're at one time thinking, what a great job. You only talk for one hour a week. What a great job, right? I mean, you know. And then I became a pastor, and I found out, oh, this is 24-7 here. Uh, This is a little bit different. Um, Yeah, it's not an easy job. And I think that without God's calling on your life to do that job, good luck. But there's other ministries, I think, that fall under the same category. The youth ministry, for instance. That's a hard one, too. You know, to deal with kids and to try to keep kids excited. And, you know, David and Katie, they have quite a challenge there in their lives. They have a charge from me to do that right, to be honorable in, in, in the decisions they make with these, these kids because we're really placing them in their care, in a sense, And that's what's happening here with Solomon. God is placing the the nation in his care. And he's going to tell him here, it seems like almost an impossible request or command to keep charge, to keep the charge of the Lord. But he's going to show him here how he can do it. First thing is to continue to walk in his ways. You got to continue walking in the ways of the Lord. You can't get a position and then abandon all the ways of the Lord and try to do it in your own strength or according to your own plan or some other man's plan. It's so important at that point to be able to say, you know, Lord, uh, well, we're going to find Solomon making a very humble request. I don't want to be rich, I don't want to be famous. I I just want to judge your nation and your people properly. That really blessed the Lord. That showed something about Solomon's heart in the early days. He wanted to continue to walk in the ways of the Lord. And what does that mean? How do you define that? Because you know the world we're living in today. You go out there outside these doors and talk to other people. They're going to tell you there's all different kinds of strange ways that you can walk with God. You know, you can kind of make it up as you go these days. Um, But no, that's not what we're talking about here. It says, you're going to keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in His ways. How do I do that? By keeping His commandments and His statutes and His judgments and His testimonies. Now, do those all seem like they might be related to one another? They are very related to one another. Um, One is attached to the other. They're they're a uh, a quilt, if you will, um, of different things that are brought together to accomplish one goal here. The goal is that whatever you do will prosper. That's the goal. That's the goal in your life and in my life. That whatever we do, if we attend to these things right here. And notice, I I thought this was interesting when I saw this. It doesn't say to to walk in your ways. It doesn't say to keep your statutes or Bob's statutes or someone else's. Keep 
his statutes. Every single time the word his comes into play here. It's not about me, not about what I think, not about how I would do things if I were in charge. It's not about that at all. Every single one of us as believers in Christ have the very same responsibility as Solomon did here. To walk in his ways, to keep his testimonies and his judgments. And so, you know, we hear testimonies all the time from people. We hear about how faithful God is and what great things God can do in our lives and what he has done in, his li- in our lives. And it's good to talk about those things and remember those things. You know, you remember 15 years ago coming to a town where you knew no one to start a little Bible study at the school over there, not knowing what next Sunday is going to bring. She knows because she walked in the room the very first Sunday we were there. And uh, boy, she's been with us ever since, a long, long time. But, but, you know, you would have never dreamt going into that school on that first Sunday morning that 15 years down the road, this is what God has done, right? This is the greatness of the Lord. And why has it worked out so well? You know, because we have followed his ways. We have stuck to his word. We are not all about smoke and mirrors and emotional hype and all that kind of stuff. We just want to serve the Lord with all of our heart and then see what he'll do. You know, people put so much effort into their ministry, whatever it might be. Um, I was asked a question a long time ago that really sobered me up. How many people have you led to the Lord? That was a bad one for me because I had to say, let me think here. One, two, three, maybe three that I've actually sat down with and witnessed to them and prayed the sinner's prayer with them. You know, how many people have you led to the Lord? Well, 722. Wow, you led a lot of people. You must be a success. I must be a failure. You know what people say to me all the time, especially when I go to a conference? So, hey, pastor. How many people you got in your church? As though this is the measure of success. Okay? And it used to bug the heck out of me because it was actually embarrassing because I'd have to say, about 20. Right? About 50. And then I, you know, and of course, you know, they're like, oh yeah, well, we have 7,000. Oh, pfft, right? Hang your head. Hang your head in shame. You know, <laughs> well. So anyway, I had to learn that lesson early on that God has called you to something. Every single one of you. All of you. And you're faithful in the thing that he's called you to. The outcome of it is his responsibility. How it grows and develops is his responsibility, not yours. What this church ends up being in the end, that's God's work, not mine. I just want to keep it simple. I just want to teach the Bible. That's all I've ever wanted to do. I never dreamt that I would find myself in this place like this, uh, especially Sheridan, Oregon, uh, of all places, you know. Matter of fact, I had to have a heart change because before I was walking with the Lord, all this place served for me was drinking and drugging and knowing a lot of people that do. And so when they said, we want, to, we want you to go to Sheridan, it was like, I can't go to Sheridan. They know me out there. <laughs> you know, they're going to be going, oh, I know that dude. Yeah, oh boy, he's a pastor? Come on. You know. So... Yeah, the principles that we have here are very, very simple, you guys. If you're faithful in what God's called you to do, He will bless your calling. You don't have to worry about that. He's going to let it mature and let it grow, and you're going to bear fruit um, in whatever He's called you to do. And here, He's being encouraged to allow the law of Moses to dictate how He governs. Now, we had... Our country was founded on godly principles, right? Christian principles. Um, 
and a lot of people will say, oh, well, you know, some of those guys were, came from masonry, or they came from this, or they came from that. Well, I don't really know all that stuff. I just know what I read that they wrote down. I, I see some of the writings of some of the early fathers of our country. These men had a close relationship with God. And they warned the people in this country what would happen if we forsook the things of God. Well, gee whiz, lo and behold, look around. This is what happens. It doesn't matter. You know, this is an experiment. The United States of America, we're a fledgling com country compared to some of the other, like the Roman civilization that was around 2,000 years right before it collapsed we're only around what 250 and we're imploding already because we've turned away from the principles that allowed us to be the united states of america and it's very interesting when you when you look at um history of the united states and then you track what we're going to be studying as we go down through these books, you're gonna see Israel abandon their principles too. You're gonna to see their nation implode and become very, very wicked. As a matter of fact, there's gonna be a time when the Bible, the, what they had was the law of Moses, the Pentateuch, it's gonna be missing, it's MIA. No one even knows where it's at. The temple's there, but it's so full of idols from other Countries, Baal, and all these different idols, and sacrificing to these false gods, and buried somewhere within all that stuff was their Bible. They hadn't even looked at it for a couple hundred years. They had no clue. They were just, they became just like all the other nations around them. And when you turn your back on God, that's what happens. A nation just becomes like all of the other ungodly nations. A person becomes just like all the other ungodly people when they turn their back on the Lord. Some of you have lived that out and you know. But here's the thing that is so cool about this. If you keep these simple principles, Solomon, your kingdom will prosper it says that you will prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. I love that. Whatever you do, wherever you turn, I'm going to bless you. That the Lord might fulfill his word. Now David's kind of getting backwards now. He's going to go backwards a little bit because you remember that God told David that your throne's going to be forever. That there's going to be a... a a descendant of David sitting on the throne of Israel forever. If, there's the big one, if your sons take heed to their way, if they walk before me in truth with all their heart and their soul. And he said, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Israel had a beautiful future in store for it. An awesome future. The, they could have been the greatest nation on the earth. But yet they turned into just like all the other nations. Moreover, verse 5, you know also. Now, now, now he's going to get into, here's some business for you to take care of, son. Some people did me wrong. And I want you to deal with this after I'm gone. Moreover, also, you know what Joab, you remember Joab, the son of Zeruiah, did to me. And what he did to the two commanders of the armies of Israel, to Abner, the son of Ner, and Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he killed. And he shed the blood of war in peacetime. And he put the blood of war on his belt that was around his waist, and on his sandals that were on his feet. You remember, David was trying to get things worked out. He was trying to bring a time of peace to Israel. And Joab, he was a warmonger. Joab went against the king's will and killed these two men. 
Not only did he kill these two men, but he also was in on taking out Absalom, David's son. He shed the, these people's blood, verse 6, therefore, because of that, I want you to uh, do not let his gray hair go to the grave in peace. However you think it's best there, son, I want you to seek out some justice on my behalf. So therefore, you know, but show kindness. Now this is the opposite now. David's remembering the people that backstabbed him. Now he's going to remember those who also supported him. Show kindness to the sons of Barzillai, the Gileadite. And let them be among those who eat at your table. For so they came to me when I fled from Absalom, your brother. They provided supplies for them, you might remember. They, they provided protection. They provided a, a place for David to, to lay his head when, when Absalom, was, was when that coup was going on in, in Israel, and Absalom was trying to seize the throne, of which he did for a short time. In verse 8 he says, Now you see, you have with you Shimei, the son of Gera, a Benjamite. Now you guys remember Shimei? He's the guy that was out there on the path when David was leaving Jerusalem in shame with all of his family marching behind him with their heads hanging low. He's the guy that was standing there cursing David. He's the one that his guy next to him said, let me just go over there and stick a spear in that dude and shut him up. David said, no, let him go. I probably deserve it. And he did. And, and you notice what, 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 what tribe he came from. He was a Benjamite. Well, who else do we know in our story here that was a Benjamite? Saul. This is part of Saul's family. This guy's got a beef with David because he took the throne when maybe even Shimei was in line for the throne because he was in the same family as Saul. A Benjamite who cursed me with a malicious curse in the day when I went to Mahanaim. But he came down to meet me at the Jordan, and I swore to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put you to death with the sword. So David didn't lift his sword against this man, but he hasn't forgotten. He hasn't forgotten what took place. Now remember, David truly was still the rightful king of Israel. David would have never done this to this guy's uh, uncle or whatever Saul was. How many times did David say, I am not going to touch Saul. I'm not going to kill him. Even though I have had chance after chance, I am not going to touch the Lord's anointed. He knew about respecting the office above and beyond the respect of the person. Yeah, Saul was a schmuck. He was a flake. He was an idol worshiper. He was mentally ill he had all these things going on but he was still the king and because he was the king David respected that and he honored that but Shimei on the other hand did not he was trashing David um, all the way down the path all the way down to the Jordan River you can imagine the guy just hanging there just yelling at you he was throwing rocks at them he was doing all kinds of things to try to humiliate David. And so <laughs> he tells him about this guy too. Now therefore, do not hold him guiltless. Evidently he's still hanging around for you're a wise man and you know what you ought to do to him. And once again, bring his gray hair down to the grave with blood. Avenge me. So David rested with his fathers and he was buried in the city of David which is Jerusalem the period that David reigned over Israel was 40 years seven years he reigned in Hebron and in Jerusalem he reigned 33 years 40 years does that number spark anybody's curiosity 40 40 years how many years did Israel wander in the desert? Forty years. That's right. 
How many days did Jesus stay out in the wilderness being tempted? Forty days and forty nights. That number 40 is a number of a time of testing. And truly, David went through a lot of tests and failed, didn't he? But God was still molding him, and God was still shaping him, and God still had a plan for David. But here's the thing. Why didn't God let him reign 41 years? Or why wasn't it just 39 years? Because this number's significant. It's important. It tells us that David's reign was already calculated by God. He knew exactly how long David was going to reign as the king in Israel, and it was 40 years. So we leave him now. We leave him in the tomb. And then Solomon, in verse 12, sat on the throne of his father, David. And his kingdom was firmly established. That's a nice little side note. Everything's starting out pretty good here. Everything is starting out with a bang. He's, he's on the throne. He's got his adversaries out of the way. He's going to avenge his father. And the kingdom is firmly established for a few minutes. Right? So now we learn about Adonijah the son of Haggith. Adonijah came to Bathsheba. Now, what was Adonijah trying to do? He was trying to take the throne. And what did Solomon tell Adonijah? Behave yourself. If you behave yourself and show yourself a man of honor, then not a hair off your head is going to... But if you do something wrong, you're going to go down, Absalom. Well, evidently, the guy hadn't learned his lesson because right away, he came to Bathsheba, Solomon's mother. Wow, what a back-around-the-backstab play that is, right? I know I can't deal with Solomon, so I'll go to his mom. So he goes to Bathsheba, and she says to him, Do you come in peace? And he said, Yes, I'm coming peaceably. Okay. And moreover, he said, I have something to say to you. And she said, say it. And then he said, you know that the kingdom was mine. Now right there, Bathsheba should have said, no, it wasn't. It was Solomon's kingdom from the very beginning. It was never yours. But she doesn't. You know that the kingdom was mine, and all of Israel had set their expectations on me that I should reign. However, the kingdom has been turned over and has become my brother's, for it was his from the Lord. Oh, that's kind of telling right there, isn't it? Adonijah, where are you going with this? What you're saying is that the almighty creator of the universe has chosen Solomon to be the king? But you're trying to tell Bathsheba that you really should be the king. The people like you. I mean, you know, he won the popularity contest, didn't he? He's the one that would go down to the gate and he would shoo the people. He would, he would really make himself to be a real sweetheart in their eyes. And he was very popular. That's why the coup almost worked, because you might remember, there were a lot of people that, uh, that followed him. You know, it's really sad, uh, the day that we live in today, the people that get put into office, they don't get put into office because of their character. They don't get put into office because they love their country. They get put into office because they're black, handsome, female, they get put into office for every other reason other than why they should be put in office, right? This is, this is this guy right here, the same, same thing. It's no different. It's too bad. It's amazing to me, though, as we go down through these scriptures and you look at what's going on here and you say, wow, we're living in that right now. That's crazy. 
We're seeing that play out in our own lives right now. So he wants to uh, ask for one petition, one petition. So don't deny me. And she says, well, what do you want? He says, I want you to go to King Solomon because he will not refuse you. That he might give me Abishag, the Shumanite, as my wife. And Bathsheba said, very well, I'll go speak for you to the king. Well, again, Adonijah is plotting and planning and still trying to overthrow the kingdom. Do you remember who this woman is? It's one of David's wives. David was married to this woman. And she gave him no children. And now that David's gone, the ultimate insult would be to marry his father's wife. Not only was it immoral, unethical, but it was against the law of God to do such a thing. But Bathsheba, I got to kind of wonder about her. She seems pretty weak in spirit to me. You know, I mean, think about it from the very beginning. David said, get over here. Okay. She, it seems like she just didn't have a whole lot of willpower, maybe. Pa- I don't know what the word would you would, but here, he, here this guy's coming. She knows he's the enemy. Maybe she's saying it to protect her own skin. I don't know. So she went to King Solomon to speak to him for Adonijah. And the king rose up to meet her and, and bowed down to her, showing his mother honor, which is great, and sat down on his throne. And had a throne set for the king's mother. She had her own throne. And so she sat at his right hand. And then she said to him, I desire one small petition of you. Do not refuse me. And the king said to her, Ask it, my mother, for I will not refuse you. That, that kind of reminds me of the story of John the Baptist when he opened his mouth and just said, Ask me for whatever you want and I'll give it to you. And she said, Oh, I want John's head. Whoa. I didn't mean that. Uh, So she says in verse 21, Let Abishag the Shumanite be given to Adonijah, your brother, as a wife. Wow. How insulting. And King Solomon answered and said to his mother, Now why do you ask Abishag the Shumanite for Adonijah? Ask him for the kingdom also? For he is my older brother, for him, and for Abathar the priest, and for Joab. In other words, are you going to give it all away? What are you you doing here? You're going to give my father's wife to my brother. You might as well just give the whole kingdom away. He's not very happy with mom at this point right now. (coughs) And King Solomon swore by the Lord saying, May God do so to me and more also, if Adonijah has not spoken this word against his own life. Now Solomon's kind of getting the hang of things here. There is no way I'm going to let you dishonor my dad like that. This is the straw that broke the camel's back. Therefore, verse 24, as the Lord lives who has confirmed me and set me on the throne of David my father, and who has established a house for me, as he promised, Adonijah shall be put to death today. Well, what about trial? No trial. This is a death sentence. And he deserves it because he was given a chance at life already. He could have humbled himself. He could have, he's his brother. He could have came to him and said, I'm going to work with you, Solomon. We're going to be a great team. And I understand that you're the the king. And I'll honor that and respect that. But no, he couldn't do it. He had so much pride. um, And he was thinking in the flesh. He's thinking in the natural. He wants that throne. He wants the glory. He wants the riches. And that's really all he cares about. 
So King Solomon sent by the hand of Benaniah. Benaiah, Benaiah. How do you say that one? The son of Jehoiada. <laughs> and he struck him down. And he died. And to Abathar the priest, the king said, Go to Anathoth, Anathoth, to your own fields, for you're deserving of death, but I will not put you to death at this time, because you carried the ark of the Lord God before my father David, and because you were afflicted every time my father was afflicted. You used to support my dad. You, you used to be a great man. But now here you are, conspiring against me. Go home. Stay home. Don't come around me anymore. So Solomon removed Abathar from being the priest of the Lord, which he spoke concerning the house of Eli in Shiloh. So then news came to Joab, for Joab had defected to Adonijah, though he had not defected to Absalom. So Joab fled to the tabernacle of the Lord and took a hold of the horns of the altar. We've seen this before. And King Solomon was told, Joab has fled to the tabernacle of the Lord. There he is by the altar. And then Solomon sent Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, saying, Go and strike him down. Now Joab, he's a big deal. He's the, he was the commander. He had a lot of responsibility placed on him. But he, he betrayed David. What is that noise? Oh, it stopped. It wasn't my pacemaker. I don't have one. Anyway, so Benaiah went to the tabernacle of the Lord and he said, Thus saith the king, Come out. And he said, No, I will die here. And Benaiah brought back word to the king, saying, This is what Joab said. Thus he answered me. And the king said to him, Do as he has said, and strike him down, and bury him, that you may take away from me and from the house of my father the innocent blood which Joab shed. So the Lord will return his blood on his head, because he struck down two men more righteous and better than he. And he killed them with the sword, Abner the son of Ner, and the commander of the army of Israel, and Amasa the son of Jether, the commander of the army of Judah, though my father David did not know it. Their blood shall therefore return upon the head of Joab, upon the head of his descendants forever, but upon David and his descendants, and upon his house and his throne, there shall be peace forever from the Lord. Well, unfortunately, that prophecy doesn't come true, totally. Because there wasn't peace forever. It was offered, it was possible, it could have been, should have been, it would have been. But they diverted away from those original things that David had encouraged them to live by. So Benaiah the son of Jehoiada went and he killed him. And he was buried in his own house in the wilderness. The king put Benaiah the son of Jehoiada in his place over the army. And the king put Zadok the priest in the place of Abathar. And then he sent and he called for Shimei and said to him, Build yourself a house in Jerusalem and dwell there. And do not go out from there anywhere. You are on house arrest. For it shall be on the day that you go out and cross the brook Kidron. Know for certain you'll surely die. And your blood shall be on your own head. Shimei said to the king, The saying is good. As my lord the king has said, your servant will do. So Shimei dwelt in Jerusalem many days. So here he is, he's showing mercy once again to this man. He's saying, go to your house, don't go anywhere else, you're grounded. Now it happened at the end of three years that two slaves of Shimei ran away to Achish, the son of Maacah, the king of Gath. And they told Shimei, saying, look, 
your slaves are in Gath. So Shimei arose and he saddled his donkey and went to Achish at Gath to seek his slaves. And when Shimei had brought his slaves from Gath, Solomon was told that Shimei had gone from Jerusalem to Gath and had come back. Three years later. So the king sent and called for Shimei, and he said to him, Did I not make you swear by the Lord and warn you, saying, No, for certain on the day that you go out and travel anywhere, you shall surely die? And you said to me, The word I have heard is good. Why then have you not kept the oath of the Lord and the commandment that I gave you? I gave you an opportunity to live, and now... You think because three years has gone by that I forgot about you? He didn't want this guy running around because he was one of these guys that would poison people's minds. He was untrustworthy. And so he's trying to control him by telling him to stay in his own home. You know, Jimmy, I could have sent a couple of other slaves to go find his slaves. He could have sent someone else to Gath and where's Gath, anyway? Well, Gath is where the Philistines came from. That's where Goliath came from. So here you are leaving Jerusalem, the safety of your home. You're going into some heathen city to try to find your slaves. Doesn't tell us whether or not he found them. The king sent and he called for Shimei, of course. They have this little conversation, and down in... Uh, Verse 44, the king said, moreover, to Shimei, you know, as your heart acknowledges, all the wickedness that you did to my father David. Therefore, the Lord will return your wickedness on your own head. But King Solomon shall be blessed, and the throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever. So the king commanded Benaniah, the son of Jeho Je Jehoiada. And he went out and struck him down. And he died. Thus, the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. So, very interesting. Cleaning house, so to speak, huh? Cleaning house, getting all the traitors out of there. Getting all those who were against his father out of there. Um, so he does, you know, we do the same thing, well, not exactly like that, but when we get a new administration, they're able to go in and choose a new cabinet, and they're able to pick whoever they want to be in their cabinet, and they want to get rid of the guys that aren't going to work with them, so they fire them. Instead of putting them to death, they just fire them. Uh, so anyway, pretty interesting here. Time after time now, Solomon has attempted to be a merciful king. He's attempted to, you know, say, hey, what you did was wrong, but, you know, I'll give you a shot. I'll give you a chance. And each time he did that, he got burned. He got deceived. And so he didn't hesitate to take these guys down. And now it says the kingdom is established in the hand of Solomon. No more traitors. So we're going to park right there. Perfect timing. Uh, we'll pick this up in chapter 3. We will begin to see uh, Solomon's downfall already, starting in chapter 3. So we'll come back together for that next week. Let's pray. Father, uh, some of these words are really hard, Lord. Some of these are uh, hurtful. Uh, but we know human nature. We know the sinful nature. We know the horrible things that that can do. We're thankful tonight, Lord, that you've given us power over that. We're thankful tonight, Lord, that with your blood and your Holy Spirit pow empowering us, that we don't have to be controlled like that anymore. That we don't have to be a slave to sin. That we can choose not to. We can choose to keep your statutes. 
and your testimonies and your precepts and your laws. We can choose to serve you with all of our hearts, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. So we thank you for that tonight. Thank you for this awesome record here that we have, this historical and spiritual uh, record that you give us. And Lord, I just pray that you would be with each one of us as we leave tonight um, and bring us back together again Sunday morning that we might continue studying your word, fellowshipping with each other. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.